Welcome to lecture 1.1, What is a Group? In the first series of lectures, uh, you are going to learn intuitively what a group is so you can understand the concept before you see the formal definition, which won't actually appear until lecture 1.6. Our introduction to group theory will begin with the famous Rubik's Cube toy pictured below. This was invented in 1974 by Erno Rubik of Budapest, Hungary, though it didn't really become popular until the 80s. Uh, Erno Rubik is a Hungarian inventor, sculptor, and professor of architecture. Now, according to his Wikipedia entry, he is known to be a very introverted and hardly accessible person, almost impossible to contact or get for autographs. Not impossible, just almost impossible, as shown by this picture of yours truly and Professor Rubik from 2010 in Budapest, Hungary. And I should note that his Wikipedia page has since been updated and that one passage has been removed. This was actually taken at the opening of the Akinkum Institute of Technology, which is a wonderful study abroad program for North American undergraduates who are majoring in computer science or engineering. And uh, for, t for 25 years now, there's actually been a classic mathematics program in Budapest called the Budapest Semesters in Mathematics that I highly recommend you look into if you are interested. And so this, this was meant to complement that for, for non-math STEM fields. The cube comes out of the box in the solved position, but of course we can scramble it by rotating one of its six faces. And the result might look something like this. Now the goal of course, is to return the cube to its original solved position, and all you can do is rotate one of the six faces. Now, since Rubik's Cube does not seem to require any skill with numbers to solve it, you may be inclined to think that it's not a mathematical puzzle. Now, the big idea from this lecture, and actually from the course, is group theory is not about numbers. I mean, I guess there, there's plenty of numbers that do arise in group theory. You can apply it to numbers. But the concepts behind group theory are about patterns and symmetry. And these are things that the Rubik's Cube possesses in abundance. Okay, so let's explore the Rubik's Cube in a little more detail. In particular, let's, let's identify some key features that will be recurring themes in our study of patterns and symmetry. So here are some questions that I want you to ponder. First of all, how did we scramble up the cube in the first place? And how do we go about unscrambling it? So there are some sort of rules that you have to have. And things that, you know, what counts as a move and what doesn't count as a move. So that's the next question. What actions or moves do we need in order to scramble and unscramble the cube? Now, obviously, you could peel the stickers off and put them back. But do you want to actually allow that as a move? When you're scrambling the cube, you often rotate it in space and move it you know, from your left hand to your right hand, but those are moves, but you, those are things that you typically ignore. They're not really important. They're not things that you are gonna see in a solutions manual. So again, these are vague questions, so there's many correct answers. Now, how is Rubik's Cube different from checkers? Oh, checkers is a game. There's, a, there's a, a winner, but there's other differences too. Sometimes in checkers, you can get stuck. There's some pieces that you can't move, some pieces that you can. Again, open-ended questions. Um, how is Rubik's Cube different from poker? Well, there's obviously no element of chance in Rubik's Cube. Well, I mean, you, you could, in theory, get lucky with solving it, but in principle, there, there is no stochastic element in solving a Rubik's Cube. Observation one, there is a predefined list of moves that never changes. And here by moves, I want to say any sequence of twists, or of I should say of quarter twists of the faces. So I'm not allowing um, taking off the stickers, taking apart the cube, or rotating in the space. I'm just looking at the actual sequence of quarter turns that you can make. Those are the moves. Observation two, every move is reversible. If you do a sequence of twists, you can just undo those and get back to where you started. Every move is deterministic. That's observation three. So this is unlike 
poker or rolling a or a dice game where there's an element of chance and also I should say observation two every move is reversible that is unlike say checkers you can't move backwards in checkers observation four moves can be combined in any sequence so if I do one sequence of twists and then another sequence of twists I can just do those back to back and I get a new sequence of twists and this is again something that does not arise in like poker or checkers so again in this setting a move is a twist of one of the six faces by 0 degrees 90 180 or 270 and of course you don't need to um, if you want to only count uh, twists of 90 degrees that's fine because a twist of 180 is just two consecutive twists of 90 so we could add more to our list. We could add more observations. We could add more moves. We, we could add a, a move of, of a twist of 540 degrees, but let's not do that because we don't really need it. So as we shall see, these four observations are sufficient to describe the aspects of the mathematical objects that we wish to study. Okay, so what does group theory have to do with this? Group theory studies the mathematical consequences of these four observations, which in turn will help us answer interesting questions about symmetrical objects, such as the Rubik's Cube. Group theory arises everywhere in puzzles, visual arts, music, nature, the physical and life sciences, computer science, cryptography, and all throughout mathematics. Actually, in the third lecture in this series, um, that entire lecture will be devoted to groups. It's, it's titled Groups in Science, Art, and Mathematics. Basically, lots of pretty examples. Group theory, in my opinion anyways, is one of the most beautiful subjects in all of mathematics. So some people like analysis when there's epsilon delta proofs or uh, calculus, but to me, it's hard to get any more beautiful than studying the mathematics of symmetry and shapes and things like the Rubik's Cube. It's, it's hard to beat that. I'm obviously a little bit biased. Okay, so instead of considering our four observations as descriptions of the Rubik's Cube, which is what we did, what we will do soon in the next slide is we will actually rephrase those observations as rules, which we call axioms, and that will define the boundaries of the objects of study, in other words, groups. So advantages of this endeavor well, first of all, we make it clear what it is we want to explore. And right now, it's a little bit vague. It helps us speak the same language so that we may know that we are discussing the same ideas and common themes, though they may appear in vastly different settings. So, you know, we may have, uh, so in one case, we may be looking at the symmetry of the Rubik's Cube, and in another case, we may be looking at the symmetry of some wallpaper design or of some... I don't know, some crystal that comes up in chemistry. And finally, uh, the rules provide the groundwork for making logical deductions so that we can discover new facts, um, many of which are surprising. So we're going to start with four simple rules, and we will prove a whole bunch of very non-trivial properties of these objects called groups from those basic rules. And that's essentially what we do in mathematics. We just define a few basic definitions, and then we prove deep theorems just from those definitions. Okay, so rules of a group. So our rules. Rule one, there is a predefined list of actions that never change or never changes. Rule two, every action is reversible. Rule three, every action is deterministic. And rule four, any sequence of consecutive actions is also an action. Okay, so let me ask you, what changes were made in the rephrasing? Now, a few comments about this, um, or answers, I guess. We swapped the word move for action. It's, it's subtle, but I like the word action better. Um, the usually short list of actions required by rule one is our set of building blocks, and we call them the generators. So, um, to solve a Rubik's, or not to solve a Rubik's cube, to 
play with a Rubik's Cube, you really only need six actions. There are six faces of a Rubik's Cube, and you can generate any complicated sequence of twists by twisting one of the six faces by 90 degrees. So, um, so we call those the generators, uh, and those generate the uh, usually much more numerous um, set of actions. And rule four tells us that any sequence of the generators is also an action. So no matter how we put the generators together, we get another action. Okay, so here's our informal definition of a group. A group is a set of actions satisfying rules one, two, three, and four. And I want to emphasize, I'm saying a group is a set of actions, that is, things that you do. So in the setting of the Rubik's Cube, there is a difference between a configuration of the Rubik's Cube and an actual action of twisting the faces. So the group of the Rubik's Cube is the actual set of all possible twists of the faces, not the set of all configurations. That said, I should clarify a little bit more. Um, a lot of times, two sequences of moves or actions are indistinguishable. So for example, if you rotate a face by 90 degrees clockwise, that's the same thing as rotating that same face five times. Because um, if you rotate it four times, you get back to where you started. So we will say that two such moves are the same. So again, rotating a face uh, once or five times or nine times, it's all the same thing. Here's a fun fact. There are 43, I don't even know what that number is, um, okay, 4.3 times 10 to the 19th distinct configurations of the Rubik's Cube. That's a lot. So while there are infinitely many possible sequences of moves, because you, know, you can rotate a face one time, five times, nine times, or two billion times, or as many times as you want, start, if you start from the solved position, this is how many truly distinct moves there are. So that's the number of configurations or the number of distinct moves. So it's the size of the Rubik's Cube group. So all of these 4.3 times 10 to the 19 moves or actions are generated by just six moves. Again, there are six faces of the Rubik's Cube. And if you, are, if you only allow yourself to rotate a face 90 degrees clockwise, then those six actions can generate all, all of these. So let's call these generators A, B, C, D, E, and F. I don't care which one is which. Uh, but the point is, every word over the alphabet uh, um, on these six letters describes a unique configuration of the cube starting from a fixed solve position. And it also describes a unique action in the group. So if you wanted to write a solution manual for the Rubik's Cube um, and put it online, um, you could do it using just these six letters because they, those moves, those actions generate all possible moves and thus all possible configurations. Okay, so now let's summarize the big ideas of this lecture. Loosely speaking, a group is a set of actions satisfying some mild properties deterministic, reversibility, and closure. A closure, I mean, if you do a sequence of moves, that is still another move. So a generating set for a group is a subcollection of actions that together can produce all actions in the group. You think of it like a spanning set in a vector space. Usually, a generating set is much smaller than the whole group. We saw this with the Rubik's Cube group. It had 4.3 times 10 to the 19th actions and could be generated by just six actions. And we will shortly see groups that have infinitely many actions that can be generated by just a couple or even one generator. So given a generating set, not surprisingly, the individual actions are called generators. The set of all possible ways to scramble a Rubik's Cube is an example of a group. 
it's not the simplest group we're going to see, definitely not, but it, it's nice because it, it's something that you're probably familiar with. So two actions are the same if they have the same net effect. For example, twisting a face one time versus twisting a face five times. An important thing to note is that the group is the actual set of actions one can perform on the cube, not the set of configurations. However, there is a bijection between these two sets. If you take any scrambled configuration then and fix a solved state, then there is one way to go from that solved state to that, config uh, to that configuration. Well, there's actually many ways, but you say that those are all the same action. Now, later in this class, we are going to actually return to looking at both the set of actions and the set of configurations, but that's, that's much later down the line. And finally, tying this back to the Rubik's Cube again, the Rubik's Cube group has 4.3 times 10 to the 19 actions, but it can be generated using a set of size 6.